Hello. Oh, well, wow. okay, I've got a mic. Yes, welcome back, everybody. Um, as we look at this space of digital agriculture, uh, sometimes we have these questions about what's the readiness, what's the state of digital agriculture in different countries where we work. And um, I want to introduce Vitska Krop of Siat, who's done some work ex uh, exactly uh, on that, precisely on that. So, Vitska. Thanks, Brian. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a project we did with the FAO, the World Bank, and the African Development Bank, where we created snapshots of digital ag around the world. So what do I mean with this snapshots? What we did is we assessed the country's preparedness for digital transformation in agriculture. And then we guide digital technology interventions in food systems. So far, we have done this in eight countries, eight very different countries. If you know anything about these countries, the digital ag sector is very, very distinct. I don't have a lot of time. I only have five minutes, so I cannot go into all of the interesting details that we found during these studies. So I'll just try to highlight some of them during the journey of the, of the process that I'm going to be explaining. So first, I would like to um, show a couple of indicators uh, on the national contacts that we have. So this is an example of Grenada. Grenada has pretty good infrastructure for digital ag. Uh, there is uh, electricity. 100% of the people have mobile phones. However, when you go to the field, none of the farmers are using any digital technologies at all. The most innovative farmers are still using farm books with pen. Why? Well, in Grenada, agriculture is not as important as tourism. And tourism, the biggest sector in the beautiful Caribbean island of Grenada, imports all of its foods. And this is a challenge, but at the same time, this is a really big opportunity for Grenada when enhancing on the digital ag to also enhance and uh, incorporate themselves into the food system of the uh, tourism industry. Another example here is Kenya, where things are less developed, however, Looking at Kenya, Kenya is a leading country when it comes to digital ag. You can see that in a number of innovations. You can see that in a number of startups. You can even see it in a number of people that were up here for the Inspire finalist. I think two or three of the projects were from, uh, from, from Kenya. Um, and this is another example. This is Turkey. Turkey is highly developed when it comes to the ag sector uh, and economically as well. You can see 97% of the people have mobile subscriptions, and 90% of the population has 4G. But then, when you zoom in to the farmers, 44% of the farmers have a smartphone and use a smartphone. When you look at what they use it for, only 2% uses it for ag. And then when you look at this 2%, only half of that actually trusts the information that they get. So only 1% of the farmers are actually using this data, or using the technologies that are available. And in Turkey, technologies are available. So you can see that in these three different countries, there are three different things to, to address and different possibilities of what you can do in those countries, in those settings. So now, let's take a look at the food system. So for this project, what we do is we differentiate between these different sections in the food sector, but also we look across the food sector, what are common technologies, and then we look at the challenges and the solutions within these, uh, what we call hubs. And so the critical question that we ask is, what does the food system need in terms of digital technologies to uh, operate more efficiently and effectively? And we ask this question to, um, to key stakeholders in country, to, in um, a stakeholder consultation. And this picture is an example of what we did in Rwanda. So these are the, the main people in Rwanda working on digital ag. And what we then do is we go through all of these different hubs. We look at what are the key challenges in the agricultural sector, specifically for that hub. And then we map what technologies can overcome these solutions. And of course, different technologies can overcome different problems. But we also look country specific. What are the options? And what is already there? And where should it go? We do an analysis where we look at the uh, progress, the maturity level of the technologies. We look at the enabling environment policies. We look at the 
potential impact on economics, on efficiency, uh, on uh, equity, and on the environment. And then from these technologies, from this analysis, we then select six or eight of these technologies that have the greatest potential uh, and are we call priority digital technology solutions. And these solutions, if public and private sector invest in these, this is how you transform the food sector. And with that, I would like to end. And on an other note, if you want to learn more about these things, we are going to be having uh, a little bit more in-depth presentation tomorrow at 4 and at 4.50 on the COP sessions of digital, uh, uh, sorry, data-driven agronomy. So you're very welcome there. And if you have any questions, come to me whenever you see me around. Thank you. And now I would like to invite uh, Ruti Muster, Musker from Kavi to the stage. Hi, everyone. I'm Ruthie Musker with CABI, and I'll be talking about getting to fair data in agricultural program development. So progress has been made in data management practice and funded agricultural programs over the past several years. Funders have a large role to play in this with the introduction and implementation of open access policies. But these open access policies oftentimes don't ensure that very data-rich programs actually release their data in a high-quality and well-managed way, leading to a loss of millions of project funding. Uh, in 2017, Kabi Godan and the Open Data Institute began exploring the success of three open access policies from DFID, USAID, and the Gates Foundation and their implementation in funded programs. Through, impl through interviews with stakeholders, many in the CGIR, the donor open data policy and practice document provided the evidence to help these three donors to agree on a joint vision recognizing their role in encouraging good data management and grantees and their implementing partners. The document also describes that in order to achieve the, the goal of using data to make good decisions in agriculture, the open access policies may not be enough, and that a move towards fair data would promote more effective decision making, foster innovation, and drive organizational change through trust and transparency. The fair data principles are taking hold in the agricultural community as a best practice. Fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Fair data is not necessarily open data, as you can articulate who the data should be accessible to and reusable by. The Gates Foundation took the evidence in the donor open data policy and practice document seriously and funded CABI and the Open Data Institute for a pilot study and subsequent two-year project until 2021. The aims of these projects were to understand the barriers and challenges to fair data and data sharing among the programs that they fund specifically in soil and agronomy in India and Ethiopia. As you can imagine, the list of challenges is not short or simple um, and will include many that I can imagine are ones that those within the CGIR are experiencing as well. In addition to these challenges, data interactions are very complex. Decisions about what data to collect, who gets access to it, who benefits from its reuse, what standards and policies to follow, who participates in this, are all important decisions and may be highly political and cultural. Countries and communities might have different attitudes to these decisions, depending on their system of government, the culture of institutions, and levels of trust between actors. In order to approach these challenges, we developed a fair data ecosystem map to conceptualize flows of data and value across funders, lead organizations, and implementing partners. Mapping the data ecosystem can help us see patterns in these interactions beyond just individual projects. It can help us to identify gaps or opportunities to, th to strengthen policy, engagement, or capacity building in ways that have network benefits. Using data ecosystem mapping can help funders and grantees to understand what may ne need to happen or take into consideration in order to ensure good fair practices are at the heart of new program development rather than as an afterthought. For example, this is a data ecosystem map that we created to visualize the challenges in data sharing that may exist among partners within a data ecosystem that might need to be considered before a grant is made. This is of data quality issues that were expressed when we were speaking to grantees and implementing partners. The source of the arrow is the source of the data, and the point of the arrow is the organization who said the data quality was not useful. 
From looking at this map, you can see that one or two organizations consistently share poor quality data. When, um, when designing a grant, just by mapping the ecosystem, it's possible to improve data management practices and anticipate and plan for certain challenges. We've used data ecosystem mapping and a strong understanding of the current challenges to support the creation of a soil and agronomy data sharing policy for the Ministry of Agriculture in Ethiopia. The policy is structured using the FAIR data principles, outlining how soil and agronomy data in Ethiopia will be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. By integrating FAIR data into the policy by design, this potentially increases the likelihood of embedding good data management and sharing practices in the government. Um, in addition to universities and others who work with soil and agronomy data. CABI and the ODI will be working with the Ministry of Agriculture and others to support implementation of this policy. Something that's come across quite strongly in conversations with all stakeholders and within the CGIR is the lack of incentive systems that exist to encourage and support good, fair data practice. We've conducted a literature review of incentive systems. Um, sorry. Um, and I've since, since conducted a workshop with the CGIR Data in Information Management Community of Practice. This is not a comprehensive list, but a sample of initial findings. There should be adequate resourcing of both time and money for fair data implementation, which includes data management plans and options for long-term data sustainability. There should be clear policies for what good practice and fair looks like. So how do you know when you have achieved fair and be confident that this will be recognized by the donor? Rewarding good practice in FAIR, including recognizing data citations, creating KPIs linked to good practice, and including FAIR compliance and performance appraisals. Stick approaches would include funder mandates with funding contingency attached and consequences for noncompliance. Um, even though through the literature review, we found that carrots have a more lasting positive effect than sticks, so we'll take this into account. Um, and additionally, as part of our project, we don't want to recreate anything. So we're working very closely with those within the FAIR data community, like RDA EGAD, FAIR Sharing, Go Fair, and the CGIR. We're also conducting an econometric study, which aims to give some monetary value to FAIR. Um, we're looking at how much money is lost due to data not being FAIR, and money and time spent on cleaning data, finding data, um, and collecting new data that there is no access to. The third piece is on standards and exploring what standards the global soil community is adopting. These pieces will help the foundation to make the case to leadership teams to further embed fair data into the grant making process. We know that the CGIR are main grantees of the Gates Foundation, so we want to make sure that we recommend that what we recommend and support on fits in with the good practices and the ethos of what's already happening. We know that fantastic resources already exist for fair data implementation and we don't want to recreate anything. We want to build off the work the 